just a reminder of what, of what took place some 21 years ago, I prepared something that I want to, uh, to read to us uh, concerning that day. I, I would imagine all of us who uh, are alive, there's a lot, of, a lot of young people, young adults that, that weren't born yet, but um, many, many, many of you remember where you were at, what you were doing on that, uh, on that morning. We had just moved from Illinois uh, to the West Coast, to the Bay Area of California, and um, hadn't even moved into to our office. Uh, we flew in, um, truck was on its way, they were shipping our cars and everything, so we just flew with some suitcases, and um, we secured a house to rent, and uh, got up, just kind of milling around, and, and uh, the idea, I wasn't starting for about two more weeks, and I thought, I'm going to go in and, and un- unpack a few books and start putting my office together when my phone rang, and it was a gentleman who had been a deacon, elder in our church in Illinois, and he was also an American airline captain, flew big jets out of, out of O'Hare in Chicago, and uh, he called and said, hey, Hey, Pastor Fred, I just want to let you know that I'm okay. I said, well, that's great. That's great, man. And he, he said, I, I wasn't flying today. And I said, well, what you, what you up to? And he said, you haven't heard. And with East Coast or West Coast time change and, and hadn't turned anything on, and he began to tell me about American Airlines um, flights that had gone into the World Trade Center, and of course we flipped it on, and our world changed very quickly from that day. Today, we remember the tragic event of 9-11. Four planes were hijacked by radical terrorists and used as bombs against the United States of America, killing, murdering over 3,000 We remember those whose lives were taken on the two planes that hit the World Trade Center. The plane that hit the Pentagon and the brave men and women who thwarted the mission of the United Flight 93 that crashed into Pennsylvania. We remember the innocent men and women and children who died at the World Trade Center and at the Pentagon. We remember the many brave firemen police officers, first responders, military and citizens that responded to help those in need at the World Trade Center, the Pentagon. And as a result, many of their lives were taken when the towers came crashing down. We remember our God today who loves people, who loves us. For God so loved the world Our God works even in the midst of tragedy. And we remember our responsibility as Christians. We sorrow with those who sorrow, and we grieve with those who grieve. We speak of hope and life, the hope and life that only Jesus can bring. And we take responsibility to pray for our nation. 2 Chronicles chapter 7 And verse number 14 says, if my people who are called by my name humble themselves, pray, seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. We remember the families of all who lost loved ones Moms, dads, sons, daughters, friends, those whose lives will forever be altered by these terrorist attacks. We remember the lives that have been lost by our military at war, the war that was waged on terrorism. We remember their families today and we grieve. We remember the men and women in our armed services that provide and protect the freedoms that we enjoy. I am proud to be an American. Still, one nation under God, 
still the land of the free and the home of the brave. Amen. Would you stand with me this morning? And I want us to pray. And I want us to pray, Second Chronicles, if you can put the scripture up. And ask God to help us do a work in us because we desperately need revival in the land today. We need revival in our nation. Father, I love you, and I come in Jesus' name, and I thank you for your faithfulness, your goodness, your mercy. I thank you that we live in this great nation. I understand that we're one nation under God. I, I under, also understand the polarization that has happened in our land where people diametrically oppose one another, where lines have been drawn and hate, hatred goes deep. God, we need healing. We need hope. We need revival. And Lord, your word gives us insight that when your people, if my people call by my name, we are Christ's followers, Christians, following in the footsteps of Jesus. Your word says when we humble ourselves, Lord, we think we know the answer. So many still think that it's an economic problem. We look at it as a political problem. We look at it from so many different views. But God, we recognize it's a spiritual problem in America. And God, I'm asking that you would work in us. Start in me. Humble, humble. If you'll humble yourself. Lord, we pray. We pray. And we're saying we can't fix it. But we know you can. Forgive us of pride, forgive us of arrogance, forgive us of apathy, indifference. May we have greater fervency in our heart than we've ever had before. May we take responsibility for the spiritual temperature of this world. God, I pray fire in this church. I pray you burn in us. I pray there be life and a dynamic and a change that comes because of the risen Savior and the power of the Spirit. We are desperate for you, Lord. Revival always starts in the house of the Lord. So start it in us. Start it in us. Do something in me. Captivate our attention. We need you, Lord. We bless this nation We've not come today to complain. We've come today to pray. And we bless this nation and we pray concerning the elections that will be happening very soon that righteousness will be established in our land, regardless of political po uh, party. Lord, that righteousness, right decisions. Lord, we know righteousness exalts a nation. Sin is a reproach to any man that righteous, whether people realize they're making it or not, that righteous decisions. Thank you for the religious freedoms that we enjoy, that we can proclaim and preach the gospel, that we do not have fear this morning, no, no fear of repercussion for proclaiming the full counsel of the Word of God. Lord, I, I pray that these things continue I pray righteous decisions, righteous people. We are looking to you. We pray today. Lord, so many times we talk about Washington and we talk about sin and we talk about, we talk about different political views. Lord, today we recognize it's you. We need you. It's not when all these people get their act together. It's when God's people get their act together. When we come before God, humble, seeking, longing for you. Fill us fresh. Lord, be with the families of those who lost loved ones, those who worked and ministered and responded. The grief, the trauma 
that people still experience and especially they remember on this day. I pray a grace over them. I pray you continue to protect our first responders and thank you for our police and our fire fighters, our ambulance drivers, all those who protect us in this community. And God be with the men and women who serve literally around the world that protect and provide the freedoms we enjoy. Keep them safe today and thank you for their commitment and call. Lord, we love you. May God have mercy on America. May God bless America. God, let revival come to your church once again. We pray it all in Jesus' name. And everyone would declare a big amen, amen. and amen. Praise the Lord. You may be seated this morning. Thank you for taking time with me to remember and to pray. You know, uh, I contemplated concerning today's, today's message, knowing it was going to be 9-11 and uh, perhaps going down a different vein, but I come back to this and feel, felt confident in my heart this is what God had for us because it goes hand in hand with the revival that we need. It's interesting to note this, that... Uh, the Sunday after 9-11, and again, we had just moved to California. We didn't plan on starting. The Sunday before, I'd visited a friend who pastors a great church in, over in Modesto. We'd been youth ministers together. He had been at the church I was at. Uh, before I went there, he had spoke for me on many occasions at youth conventions. And uh, we went to his church and was planning on having a couple more Sundays before we launched, and then 9-11 happened. And so we're quickly, we just, I felt like I needed to be there. Church needed their pastor. And on that day, it was the highest attendance in America ever, the day after 9-11. Churches were filled on that day. We had, we had a thousand more people that morning than what we ran. It was packed to overflowing. But you know what happens? We run to God, and I don't mean this to be harsh. It's not my, not my purpose, but human nature is we run to God when we have need. We run to God, help us. And then when we start to think everything's okay, then we drift. How many times have we run to God? We run to God because something's going on with the kids. We run to God because something's happening in our marriage. We run to God because, man, it was something happened in the business. And again, not to, be, not to be harsh, but it's human nature. It's like what the children of Israel, they would go through the Red Sea, experience power, victory. But then whenever they ran out of water, they'd start to complain, and then they would grow distant and cold. I mean, one time, one time, nothing was happening, so they decide to get Aaron to build a golden calf that they can worship an idol. While their leader's on the mountain, and God is declaring, you'll have no other gods before me. You'll not make any graven image. Man, we're so fickle, up and down, in and out, that we would have a consistency and have a a fire, and that we would fan the flame so that we don't live such up and down, up and down. If there's ever a time to live consistent, if there's ever a time to stay close to God, it's today. Jesus is coming back, you know. We hear it. No man knows the, the time, the hour. I know he's coming. I don't know when. But Lord, help me to live a consistent life. Help me, to be, help me to be that person that people can, help me to take some responsibility for the world in which I live. That's what, that's what Second Chronicles is all about. It's taking responsibility. And so with that in mind, I, I want to finish out this uh, 
message that we've entitled The Witness Life. The Witness Life. Because we've been talking about how God changes us, God transforms us, works in us, gives us boldness and strength and the love, all for a reason that we'll be a witness. If the world ever needed a witness, it's today. But it is actually the God-given plan and purpose that he had for his church. He told the disciples, he said, listen, you're going you're gonna to need this Holy Spirit. He had talked to them earlier. He had said, it's better that I go away. If I go not away, the Spirit cannot come. But when he comes, he's not only going to be with you, he's going to be in you. He's going to be your comforter, your advocate, counselor. He had tried to help them to understand he set the example for them. It was blatant before, before their eyes. Next Sunday, we have water baptism in between the second and third service, so you can see it going out, and the people that's coming in the third can see it. We'll do, we'll do it outside, uh, and, and it's always a wonderful time. And If you need to be baptized, you know, if you've been baptized in water, uh, you can call the office. We encourage you to be baptized, to follow after him in water baptism. Jesus never asked us to do something that wasn't important. He set the example for us. He was baptized. John said, you know, I, I'd, rather, I'd rather not. And Jesus said, no, you need to baptize me. And so Jesus is baptized. And of course, we know from the Apostle Paul the incredible symbolism and baptism of our life coming into the water and then of being buried, this watery grave, our sins being buried, and then we raise, just like Jesus rose from the dead and we walk in a new life. But something happened when Jesus came out of the water. God spoke. This is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. And then the Holy Spirit descended from heaven, landed upon him in the form of a dove. The Bible says that the Spirit stayed with him. What he was doing is he was setting the example because he's getting ready to leave. He'd been talking to him. I'm going to go. And as, he, as he's talking to them, then that moment comes. Of course, the, the crucifixion, his burial, his resurrection he said, I want you to go and wait and Terry, stay, pursue the Spirit, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and the power of the Spirit. He knew how desperately. He set the example. Listen, Jesus lived the Spirit-filled life, and he's called us to live the Spirit-filled life. How did Jesus overcome? He was tempted in every way as we are, yet without sin. How did he overcome? Same way we overcome. By the blood of the Lamb, the word of our testimony, amen. By the power of the Spirit, give us boldness to live for God and be a witness. And so, we've been walking, walking through this in these last few weeks. I want us to look at this scripture, just simply the scripture one more time this morning. And I want you to grab a hold as we, uh, as we look at Acts chapter 1 verses 8 through 11. Acts chapter 1, verses number 8 uh, and through, through 11. It says, or 6 through 11, so when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? They were thinking about earthly kingdoms. For three years, he'd been talking to them about the kingdom of God. He'd been preparing them that he is going to die and, and that he's going to go back to the Father. It's better that I go away. He's preparing them. Can you imagine what he might have thought right here? Can you imagine what Jesus might have thought at the Last Supper? He's trying to explain to them. And just, just a few hours before or, or following that, he, he's talking to them, and a few hours following that, 
They're denying that they, they know the Lord. They're hiding, they're running. He, see, he knew what he was talking about. He knows us. He knows what we need. He set the example. Following God, Holy Spirit coming upon him. We experience the resurrected Savior. We're saved when we, can, when we believe. We confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus and believe. Revelation. God's given to every man a measure of faith. What is that? Well, I believe it's enough faith to believe that Jesus rose from the dead. Then faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. But he's given to every man the measure of faith. I'm sure Jesus is thinking, man, these guys need the Spirit really bad. Oh, man. Think about this. Three years. It's about a thousand days. They spent a thousand days with Jesus. Not just once a week. Every day. Man, they're going through. They're ministering. You know, the miracles that, that they experienced and saw no distractions like, like TV or social media. Man, they sit around a campfire at night. They would talk. Jesus poured into them. We have a little bit in our Bible of what took place. But can you imagine all that thousand days? Most of you are aware before I came to pastor here, when we left California, I, a man had helped us raise quite a bit of money out in California for our church and he invited me to be his vice president of his consulting firm. He'd previously worked with John Maxwell, and then he launched out on his, on his own. This guy was a genius. Two earned doctorates. He had been a part and, and, and been involved in raising over $1 billion for churches. It was stewardship, leadership training. I had the time of my life traveling across the United States with him, and being involved in some of the most amazing meetings and seeing how God works and the synergy and all the creativity and the touch of the Holy Spirit. We'd always talk about the best, the number one way to raise the maximum amount of dollars in a local church setting is a is a three year is a three year plan. Everybody wants to do a one year. Everybody wants to do a two year. People don't want to do it for three. But but it's research that people can hold vision for about a thousand days. That three year period. These guys have been filled with vision. They've been filled with information. They've seen the, the power of God for about a thousand days. Something about that time. And they still didn't get it. They still were struggling. Now, so now that we get the kingdom, no, it's about the kingdom of God, guys. It's not for you to know the times or the season that the Father has fixed in his own authority. But you will receive power. Say it with me one more time. Power. power. One more time. Power. You'll receive power. The word is dunamis. It's dynamite. It's where we get dynamite. You're going to receive dynamite. Dunamis. Dynamite power when the Holy Spirit comes up on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up in a cloud, took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven, as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into the heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come, a, will come in the same way as you saw him go to heaven. The disciples go to that upper room and there they wait. Jesus is ascended. They go. And then on the day of Pentecost, the feast of Pentecost, 
50, 50 days after the Passover, 50 days after the, 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 the crucifixion, resurrection, 50 days, Pentecost, the Holy Spirit is poured out. They were in one mind, one accord, praising and magnifying God, and, and the Holy Spirit came, and, and the church, the New Testament church was birthed. And we're a part of that. So every year on Pentecost Sunday, what do I always tell you? Happy birthday, church. It's our birthday. It's what happened. We're a part of what they experienced. This whole book of Acts is the emphasis on witness, emphasis on power. It's a before and after picture. Before Pentecost, after. And, and it's such a radical, radical change. We went through the source of our witness, and that's the Holy Spirit produces change in our life. That when we come to Christ, there should be a change. When we, when we come to him and the Holy Spirit comes resident in our life, there should be a Are you changed since Jesus and his Spirit came into your life? We talked about it. There should be. There has to be. Because if any man is in Christ, he's new. Old passed away. We talked about how he puts courage, boldness in our life. These guys were hiding before. Now they're preaching, proclaiming. 3,000 people get saved. They can't help but talk about the things they've seen in there. There's courage. And then the Holy Spirit gives us compassion helps us to love like Jesus. The fruit of the Holy Spirit being in your life is what? It starts off with love. He helps me to love. I can't love the way I'm supposed There's people that are hard to love. There's people that are against me. They don't believe what I believe. In fact, they would attack me. They would do everything they could to undermine the church, God, this ministry, this church. See, it's not that I get to be selective in who I love. God so loved the world. I'm a Christ follower. I follow after him. God fills us with a compassion that we would not have in ourselves. God so loved. Well, then that brings us to this, the substance. What is the substance? Again, Acts 1.8, I want you to see one word that we receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my, we're witnesses, my, Jesus. You're my witness. You're a witness to me. You will be my witness. So we have this, this substance, this, this sense that we are called to witness concerning Jesus. So many times we think, I don't have anything to say. I don't have, I don't have anything to say to anyone. Oh, yes, we do. If you know Jesus, you have something to say. You say, well, what do I say? A witness is someone who has seen something and can say something about it. You cannot witness to things that you've never done or seen. In the court of law, it would be called hearsay. We witness to what we have seen in our life seen in our life, experienced, yes, but what we have seen. Have you seen the Lord? Have you experienced the change Jesus, his spirit makes? Now watch this. This is where, this is where our witness becomes verbal. I'm going to take us back to this. This message is not about guilt. I'm not here to embarrass anybody. I'm not going to ask, how many people witnessed this week? All oh, about it witnessed, raise your hand. And all you people that did, you're bad, bad. 
You don't need no condemnation from me. And God doesn't put condemnation on us, right? There's therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. When you start hearing the song, you're no good, you're no good, you're no good. <laughs> Baby, you're no good. You know who's singing it, right? It's always the enemy. So this isn't about condemnation. We've talked about that the whole idea of praying, reading our Bible, being generous givers, going to church, being a witness, that it's not activity, but it's a relationship. We do these things not because it's our religious activity, but because we love the Lord. And he said, if you love me, you're going to keep my commandment. Man, his word keeps me from sin. I'll hide it in my heart. He showed me how to pray, and he led the way. An example. Oh, I was reading this week, and, 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 and sometime I'll, I'll share it with you, and we'll maybe do a message just concerning the amount of time Jesus spent in prayer. I mean, he started off with 40 days praying in the wilderness, praying and fasting. Prayed all night before his disciples, he picked his disciples. We'll get up early and go pray. Oh, I want to be like Jesus. He needed to pray. He needed to talk to the Father. I need to talk to the Father. It's how things get done. It's how a sovereign God and finite man get together. He loves his church. He tells me not to withdraw, stay away, don't forsake. All these things. Tells me I need to give, be generous giving. Generous giver. So, so all these things are not my activity. It's because I love the Lord. It's a relationship. So this witness thing, it comes out of relationship because he's changed my life. Listen, I'm, he I'm headed to hell without Jesus. I'm self-destructing without Jesus. My marriage won't make it without Jesus. Without him, I don't have a hope. But because of Jesus, I'm free. I'm saved. I'm secure. Come on, somebody. It's all because of him. So this idea of witness, it's Jesus and what he has done. Now, I want to tell you this. Behind that verbal witness, there needs to be a consistent lifestyle. How many people have been pushed away by an inconsistent lifestyle of a follower of Christ? Now, that can't be the world's excuse when they stand before God. But I'm going to tell you something. I don't want to be someone's excuse. Man, I saw them... I heard what he said. You know, you know, preacher and people in your church, there's a lot of hypocrites. I know. Won't you come and join us? I think hypocrites ought to be in church. How about, what do you think on that? It's, it's where God can change us. See, I, I don't want to be an excuse. I don't want to worry. I don't want to say, slip up. I don't want to, I don't want to hit a golf shot. I've not done it. I play with guys. I love them to death. Hey, but I, I don't want to hit a, hit a bad shot. God forbid that would ever happen. But I don't want to hit a bad shot and say something. And what I say profanely, I lose my testimony. I lose my effectiveness. So there has to be a lifestyle behind that. I get it. But understand something. There are people who say, listen, I, I don't know what to say. I don't know how to say it. I don't, man, I'm not smart enough. And, I, you know, I don't understand. Oh, I don't, I, it, it, oh, man, you're asking me to talk to somebody. And so, pastor, I just let my life be a testimony. Well, your life better be a testimony. 
Amen. And I believe that our lives should bear witness of the change of Jesus. And I believe in a world that's crumbling and where there's fear, we can have a peace that passes all understanding. I don't understand it all, but I know God's in control. How can you be calm? How can you continue on? Do you see what's happening? Boy, it's a great opportunity to be a witness. So don't ruin your witness by an inconsistent life. But understand People aren't saved because of my life. They're saved because of his. And he said, you'll be a witness. You are going to be a witness unto me. So we live it, and then there needs to be this witness or this testimony. The life that we live must lead to the witness of of our lips. A witness in the court of law gives testimony to what they saw, what they heard, what they know. Not hearsay, not hearsay. And a guy don't get on the stand and, you know, they, and they swear him in and either the you know, the defense attorney or the prosecutor starts to ask, or ask questions and the witness just sits there, just sits there. And the judge says, did you hear the question? Yes, sir. Well, answer, just sits there. What are you doing? Well, I'm just letting my life be a testimony. <laughs> Son, speak up. What do you know? Hello? Got to be... Someone who saw, someone experienced. I suppose Luke was about nine years old. And uh, we went on one of these uh, father-son camp out, camp outs. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, I grew up, I grew up small town, grew up poor, grew up camping, grew up working farms, hauling hay all night, dirty barns, and hot, and all kinds of different things. At this juncture in my life, I just, I, you know, I'm just not a camper. <laughs> Get me an RV, I'll make it. Get me a hotel room. But I, I, did, I did the dad thing. We went camping. We, uh, but there was a bunch of dads, and we had a great time. We come, we're driving back home, and we come into our town, and we were, as we're coming down, it's, a, it's an older section of town, and there's a, right down the middle uh, of, the, uh, of the street is just these beautiful trees, and it's all older homes right there. So you got traffic going this way on this side of the medium, and then traffic here. And we pull in, pull, pull in town, I'm driving, we're getting pretty close to our house, and, and, and I come to a stop sign, and I stop. And I look, Luke's in the back seat asleep, and, and I go to take off, and man, I, I do take off. I go, and I didn't punch it, I didn't hit it hard, but I was moving forward. We were gonna go on down the road. And as I start to take off, all of a sudden, I didn't really see it, but I heard it. And it was crash. And I hit, hit the brake. And I knew enough to understand I, it was a kid on a bicycle. And I throw the car and park. And I remember it rocked. I just jammed it in park, jumped out, ran around. And it was almost to the front axle. I get down on my hands and knees, and there's a bike crumpled up under there. And there's a kid laying on the ground underneath my car. And I'm looking at him, and he's looking at me. And I'm saying, son, are you okay? And about that time, I feel a hand on my shoulder, and, and it's, uh, it's a man. And he says, he goes, let me, let me in there, sir. It's my son. It's my son. And I remember him saying, it wasn't your fault to me. It wasn't your fault. And he gets down under, and he's talking to his son. And, and um, 
I help him and we start, we pull the bike out and we pull the kid out and the bike's just crumpled up. The kid was okay. He scratched up a little bit. But when he gets out, by the time he got out, I'm telling you, there were more ambulances, fire trucks, and police officers. It was like whoosh, right there. And they're checking him out, and the police officer comes over and talking to him. He comes over and talks to me. I tell him what I, what I did and what happened. And uh, he's doing his thing, talking to the other families. And, and he came back to me. He said, are, are you okay? And I said, man, I'm I'm Okay. He said, these things are a little bit unnerving. And, and he was just, he was very kind and, and, uh, and all that. And while he's doing some work there and they're tending to the, to the kid, a, a man came over to me and he said, excuse me, sir. He said, I, I want to give you my, I want to give you my business card. Here's my name and here's my number. And he said, I was the first car on that white Honda sitting right there. And he said, I saw the whole thing happen. And if you have to go to court, if I just want you to know, you call me and I will give testimony that it wasn't your fault. What had happened is a blind corner and the kid had shot out. There was no way to see it. I'd stop, look. He saw all those things. And he said, I'll be, I'll be a witness. I'll give testimony to what I, to what I saw. Police officer comes over and he says, "Man, you're you're free to go and take care, uh, you know." And he was sympathetic. The dad said, "Hey, would you come and talk to my kid? He's been unruly. He's just been acting out. Would you come to the officer? Would you come and put the fear of God in him?" I said, "Yeah. Would you go put the fear of God in that kid right now?" <laughs> I kept that card for for years. I suppose it's somewhere in uh, one of my little card books. But, you know, think about this. He didn't have to come over there. He took responsibility. He took responsibility and said, I know what happened. I can be a witness. I can give testimony to what happened. What I'm saying is God has called us to take responsibility. Who's going to tell him? Who's going to tell them? Well, somebody else. We always think somebody. He could have said, you know what? Somebody else will help that old boy out. He said, no, not somebody else. I'm going to help him out. If he needs some help, I'm the one that's going to give testimony. At some juncture, our testimony becomes verbal. It has to. You will be a witness, and you'll be a witness unto me. A witness for the Lord. Now, I know this sounds strong, but stay with me on this. Stay, stay with me. If you, if you're not witnessing, if you're not giving a witness, a testimony for the Lord, then you're not following. If you, if you're not witnessing for the Lord, you really need to evaluate your experience with God. Hey, I'm all for telling people God loves you, and I think it's a wonderful thing. And I do it, and I think we ought to do it. You know, there's one thing I was reading this week that Muslims never hear. They never hear, Allah loves you. Man, this morning, everybody look and listen. God loves you. That's a great statement, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. God loves you. God loves you. God bless you. That's another one. God bless you. I think those are wonderful things. But we need to give testimony. He changed me. There's a difference. There's an old song we sang growing up, since Jesus came into my heart. Since Jesus came into my heart, there's a change since he came in. Do we ever, do we ever communicate that? 
Oh, pastor, I don't know how. I wouldn't know what to say. I think we understand more than we realize. I'm going to throw this real quick. I didn't put this down. This wasn't about just being practical. It was about helping us to see just that we give witness. When Jesus talked to the Samaritan woman, what did he do? He talked to her. Number one, he talked to her. Nobody else had talked to her. Not another guy. The women, man, they all shunned her. She had to go draw, draw water at a time nobody was there. Jesus talks to her. He had needs to go through Samaria. He, it wasn't on his, it wasn't the, the best way to get to where he was going. He had an appointment, a divine appointment. I think we have divine appointments every day. He talked to her about water. Hey, can you give me a drink? She gives him a drink. He takes a turn and he turns it to spiritual things. If you drink from the water I give you, you'll never thirst again. And then talks about it, who he is. Talks about Jesus. I think we have opportunity. Listen, we talk to people. How many conversations happen out in the lobby today about football? No, that's not bad. It's not bad at all. Man, the upsets. Man, this. Man, that. It was so close to da-da-da. How do, you, how do you take a common thing like football and make a transition towards spiritual things to talk about Jesus? Talk about the weather, make a transition. Talk about spiritual things, bring it in to talk about Jesus. Talk about what's happening in the world. Talk about what's happening in Ukraine. Talk about what's happening in fine. I mean, any subject you talk about what's happening in the community, make a transition to talk about Jesus. What do you talk about? Well, Thank you for asking. I'm going to tell you here, all right? 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 10. If you're following along on the Bible app, you'll have all these verses right there, and you'll see this. For time's sake, let me, let me, let me just get this to you. We witness, we witness about a man, Jesus Christ. Amen? He saved me. He changed me. I invited Jesus into my life. We witness to a story. It's the gospel story. And the gospel is described in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And it, and it says this in verse 3. He tells us the gospel. Number one, that Christ died according to the scripture. Jesus died for our sins. Second, he was buried. He was buried. It's a part of the gospel story. So you want to share the gospel? Well, what is this Jesus thing all about anyway? What is the church thing all about anyway? Well, it's, it's about this. You know, Jesus Christ lived. Do you know he died on the cross for your sin? And do you know he was buried? And that's an important part. You know why? Get this. In, in the Old Testament, a dead man had to be buried out of sight lest the earth would be defiled. So Christ bore our sins and he was buried and our sins are put out of sight. Our sins are gone. They're buried. They are as far as the east is from the west. It's in the sea of forgetfulness. At the deepest point, he's put our sin. He buried our sins. See, if you get that down, you won't have so many problems right here. No, I'm serious. Are you with me? You won't have so many hang-ups if you recognize see, so some of you are haunted by your past. Well, he's buried them. He's put them away. Some of you have such guilt over your past. Jesus Christ buried our sins. He doesn't drag them up. It's the enemy that tries to bring things up. When you realize he buried our sins, it'll help you be free in your mind. And then the Bible says this. He rose again. He rose from the dead. And he goes on to say that he was seen by the disciples. He was seen by Paul. He was seen by 500 at one time. He showed himself alive for 40 days and people saw him. That's the good news. That's the gospel. What's, what, what's your church about? What's this Jesus about? What difference does it make? Well, it makes all the difference. 
Let me tell you, let me tell you what the gospel, the gospel means good news, and the good news is Jesus died on the cross for your sin. You know what? We all know all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. He was buried. He was buried, and our sins can be buried. He forgets them. God doesn't drag them up. God doesn't hold it over you. He forgets, forgives, and forgets. We're the ones who can't. We forgive, but we can't forget. He forgets. And then he rose from the dead, and that's the power of salvation. Sin doesn't have dominion over us. If the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwells in us, he makes us alive. Resurrection power, amen. So we bear witness to this, to this man, Jesus. We bear witness to this story. Let me take you back. If you don't have change in your life, if you can't bear witness to the change that Jesus brought to your life, then how will you ever bear witness of who Jesus is? So God changed me, and he does all this. This is God's plan. I know we hide behind this, we get in this, and I got to hustle here. We get, well, I really don't have a big testimony. You know, uh, and, and we get enamored with celebrity testimony. And, and I'm thankful. I am thankful. Forever superstar, you know, Miss America, the beauty queens, the, the, the professional athletes, the rock stars, the country stars, the movie stars, all of them that receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. I am thankful that, that they do. But people say, you know, I, I, I don't have that kind of testimony. So some people here, you've been delivered from drugs or alcohol. Man, there have been some, ratty, rat, some, some rough things, and there was a radical change. You were headed one way, and now you're headed toward Jesus. Praise God for that. Hey, but you know, there's a lot of folks here. They go, you know, like, I wasn't on drugs. I wasn't on alcohol. I was never a teenage werewolf. I was never. <laughs> so what do I have to share about? Do you know I believe that the greatest testimony in all the world, mom and dads, I think you'll agree with me, is the keeping power of Jesus Christ. Because none of us want to see our kids experience the depths of sin. None of us want to see them experience pain. We want to dedicate them to God. We want to lead them to Jesus. We want them to love Jesus all the days of their life. Amen? So the keeping power from, of God is, is the greatest testimony I believe you could have. And thank God if he's delivered you from whatever. But don't think you don't have something. All of us could say, I'm different because Jesus came into my life. Amen? This, Liz, join me. This is, this is God's plan. You know, he could have, he could have wrote it in the sky. He could have put it up there. He said, Rick, Rick, get saved. <laughs> but he didn't. He could have shouted out. Could have been a voice. It wasn't. How did, he, how did he choose to take this? This man, Jesus. This gospel story. The gospel. Jesus lived. He died. He was buried and rose again. How did he? I'm going to use this expression one more time. He picked 12 guys. At the beginning, 12 guys that we wouldn't have picked to run a hamburger stand. He picked them to take the gospel around the world. And listen to me. They spent three years. They spent about a 1,000 days with him. And then they obeyed him, and they got in the right place, and they got the power of the Spirit working in him. And that resurrected Savior and the power of the Spirit. And they said, we can't help but talk about the things we've seen and heard. They gave testimony and witness of the risen Savior. 
I thank God for church growth conferences. And, you know, I mean, my goodness, we, we've got so many things. We've got a technical room and this service and everything goes up there and they're producing and putting this together for our folks online. And then it'll be produced again and cut down to be on TV. And I, we, we spend dollars to be able and I love every minute of that. I think it's all wonderful. We have lights and screens. We have the best, we have the best greeters, ushers, experienced team in the world. You can't get in this church without, hey, it's great to have you. Welcome. We're glad you're here. It's an introvert's nightmare to walk into this church. And it's all, it's all about welcoming people. Why? Those are, the, those are good things. But the change comes from Jesus. It's Jesus. People aren't changed because of all the stuff that we do. They're saved. We do all this stuff so we can present Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world, the gospel. And he can change your life. He can forgive you of your sins. He can heal your heart. He can heal your mind. He can restore your marriage. He can mend broken relationships. Amen? Yeah. And see, if we really took serious what he said, if every one of us in this room took serious what he said here, going to all the world, You'll receive power when the Holy Spirit, and you, who? You, you, you and me, all of us, you will be a witness. Do you know what would happen? Do you know what would happen? We would explode. The life, the dynamic. And I get, I get the importance of inviting people to church. Oh, Jesus said, go out in the highways and hedges. Compel them. Invite people. Why? He wants his house full. Guess he gets glory when his house is full. But, but don't underestimate the power of your witness, the influence that you have in your sphere of influence, in your world. It's how God designed for us, the church, to reach the world. It's God's plan, and it works, and it works. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I want to be a part, don't you? Amen. And then, of course, where does this go? Starts at home. Starts right here. Sometimes it's easier to start where people don't know us. Sometimes it's easier to love people we don't know. But where does it start? Our Jerusalem, right here. Our home, our home. Don't tell me you're winning the world and you're not living for God and being a witness, being a testimony, living the life at home. Right here, and then it spreads. Man, I love God, love his word, don't you? Amen. Father, thank you. Seal this in our heart, make it real. Make it real. Lord, may we not be motivated by guilt. If we're motivated by guilt, God, I know we won't, it, stay, the change won't be sustained. But if we're motivated by your spirit, if we're motivated by your word, Lord, fill us. Work in us, use us. God, I pray those lies that the enemy says, you don't know what to say. What if they ask you? What if they reject you? What if they're not interested? What if they make fun of you? All those things that, Lord, that we would, that we would no longer operate from a spirit of fear because you didn't give us a spirit of fear. You gave us a spirit of power, not timidity, but power. So, Lord, may there be a confidence a before and after, a confidence. 
a change, a compassion. And oh, Lord, what a story to talk about Jesus and to talk about what you did. And because of what you did, my life's changed. I love you, Lord. With our heads bowed and our eyes closed, let me, uh, let me just ask you this. Is there anybody here you'd say, Pastor, I, I, uh, I know I need to surrender my life, give my life to the Lord, back to the Lord. You know your life's not right. Today's your day. Would you just lift your hand to say, that's me, Pastor. I know I need to surrender my life, give my life to the Lord, back to the Lord. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Back, back in the back, thank you. Others, just boldly lift your hand till I see it and put it right back down. That's fine. Amen. Amen. Stand with me, would you please? Anybody today would say this? Man, I felt like the Lord really convicted me. Conviction's good. Condemnation's not. God shot an arrow at my heart. Anybody? Amen. Me too. God use us. Who knows what's going to happen if we really take this and, and run with it? Don't let the enemy steal it out of our heart by the time we get out of the parking lot, okay? Stay with it. Pray it. Nurture it. Lord, feel me. Stay in the Word. Stay close. Divine appointment, opportunity. Amen. If you lifted your hand to make commitment, pray with Liz and I this morning, would you please? Just pray, Heavenly Father, thank you for Jesus dying on the cross for my sin. Thank you by the power of God he rose from the dead. That Jesus lived, he died, he was buried, and he rose again. Be big in me, Lord. Fill me with your spirit. Help me to passionately love you and live for you. Thank you, Lord. Jesus' name. Amen. It's that simple. He does it. It's a start. It's a beginning. Amen. Oh, don't let the enemy lie to you. Tell you that was stupid. That was dumb. It doesn't mean anything. It does. And let him who began a work, let him continue in it. Amen. Let's receive God's word. Let's put it to work. Can anybody say amen to God's word? Let's say thank you, Lord. Uh, text the numbers. If, if you need prayer or you made a commitment, give a shout to the Lord. Hallelujah. Bless you, Lord. Thank you for being at the Island Church. God bless you this morning. We're so glad you joined us today for Worship and Word. If you prayed with us to commit your life to Christ or you want to know more, text the word NEXT to 251-244-2030. We want to celebrate with you and help you in what comes next. Don't forget to click connect on our website if you're new. And to join us in giving, you can text Island Give to 77977 or visit the islandchurch.tv slash give. We pray you have an awesome week.